I want to thank you for your patience and your diligence and your willingness to come the distance that you've come so that we could all be here together today to make a stand against the war that has been in our midst. I've been in, P Peter Bergal spoke before me and I very much appreciate Peter. We've all been kind of in the trenches together and it's been a small group of us that's been in that trench. And I know Helen pointed that out when she said that there's a small group of people here today. But I gotta tell you, you know, I believe like Margaret Mead that a small group of people make a big difference and that's the way it's always been. A small group of people make a big difference. And if you don't believe that that's true, I want to tell you something that I experienced yesterday when I was traveling up here. I came to Oregon in 1969 by accident, and I've lived in the Pacific Northwest ever since then. I still live in Oregon. When I uh, was traveling down I-84 and I saw the gorge, I was just struck by the wonder of those the geologic formations that you pass through as you go as you go towards uh, Portland and I when I got to Portland I was very much a part of the anti-war movement at that time it was the first war that I had been born into the Vietnam War that I was and others were standing up against and I, at the same time I was attempting to understand what was going on around me I read a book called Perils of the Peaceful Adam written by Richard Curtis and Elizabeth Hogan which has now gone out of print but all the problems of the nuclear fuel cycle that were exposed in that book are still with us today and they're going to be with us for a long time to come and when I read that book I decided that I had to do something about what it was that I was reading and so that led me to become an anti-nuclear activist. I taught myself administrative law. I intervened in licensing proceedings for nuclear plants that were to be built at Pebble Springs in Arlington, Oregon. Originally they were going to be built in Boardman, but unfortunately there was a bombing range there, and even though nuclear plants supposedly can you run airplanes into them and so forth, they thought maybe a bombing range might not be a good place to put those plants so they moved them to Arlington. And I also intervened against the Skagit nuclear plants up in the state of Washington. And for years, I drove up the gorge. I drove up the gorge. I went to Arlington in a grade school there. And I, and I, tested, and I was a, part, a participant in a licensing proceeding in front of the Atomic Safety and Licensing Board. And Peter, in fact, I remember Peter came up and did the Dr. Atomic show, I think, at that particular... Uh, um, licensing proceeding but you know there were all kinds of people that were involved in that proceeding the utility was in there the government was in there they didn't let us cover all the issues that were of concern to us one of the issues that they did let us cover was alternatives to nuclear power and I remember how we put on a case to show that there were alternatives to nuclear power that we could do wind generation that we could do photovoltaics and solar and so forth and they, the utility brought in all these witnesses, these fancy experts, who said, no, it won't work. You can't do it. It won't work. Yesterday, I drove up the Columbia Gorge. I haven't driven up the Columbia Gorge probably in three years. And I was, I was floored because of this journey I had taken so many times and this time, for the first time in my life, I must have passed 75 miles worth of wind generation machines. Think about that. Think about that. It didn't work. It didn't work. And yet, we stood on the line and we said that we did not want to have this technology. We wanted to have the alternatives. And now the alternatives are in our midst. Now... Today, in the Oregonian, there is a, there's an editorial which I invite you to read. It's entitled, Going Coal Free, How Oregon Can Generate a Low-Carbon Future. Now, 
and it's by uh, a man who I have some respect for, Angus Duncan, in which he exposes the fact that even with all those wind generation machines that we got, we're still not reducing the carbon to the levels that we need to reduce in order to stop this planet from being fried. And the thing that amazes me about this article, though, and again, about that 75 miles worth of wind generating machines, is I know that you and I, as that small group of people, can make the difference. We can change this world. We really can change this world. Now, I, you know, I wrote up a, a speech outline. It's amazing how you work on this stuff. I worked on it for, you know, several uh, weeks. And I'm not going to do it. And, but I do want to cut to one portion of what I want to talk about. I was going to talk about Hanford, but geez, you know, you, the doctor already was on the stage. She's examined the patient. We're sick. And you know, when the doctor examines the patient, what are you supposed to do? And they tell you that you're going to die. You know, you have to make the change in your life or you're going to die. I mean, that's really what it comes down to. The doctor's been here. The doctor's spoken about the problem that we confront. We need to reverse that problem. Chuck Johnson, who's going to be up here speaking, he's going to speak on the Columbia Generating Station. I was going to talk about that, too. But, you know, I'm not going to really steal Chuck's thunder because I think there's plenty, there's plenty here for, to go around as far as where we're at. I only have this to say. You know, in, insanity multiplies, and it's been multiplying in this environment for some time. Ten miles north of here, we got the Columbia Generating Station. It's a Mark V boiling water reactor. It's very similar to the reactors that melted in Fukushima. There's already, uh, Helen talked about, I think Peter, I can't remember, talked about how we've got MOX fuel that's been, or I think it was May that talked about it, MOX fuel that's been suggested for uh, the uh, Columbia Generating Station. Well, guess what? The Fukushima number 3 reactor was burning MOX fuel. It's melted down. And it's exacerbated the accident because you're putting the plutonium into the environment. And, you know, when you think about Fukushima, I, I'm, I'm, I'm amazed when I think about Fukushima. I wake up one morning and on the news, they're talking about three nuclear plants that are melting down. Now, the whole time I've been an activist and I've been around these pro-nuclear people, they were always saying, oh, no. You can't have a catastrophic accident at a nuclear plant. Well, the probability of that's happening is one in a million years. I always wondered how the hell they knew that. But, you know, they seem to know that. And here I wake up one morning, and you got three of them melting down together. And an explosion in a fourth one, and the spent fuel pools full of radioactive waste. The, up, up here at uh, Columbia Generating Station, they got a bunch of spent fuel up there, too. They got it in dry casts on concrete pads, just like they have it at Trojan, waiting for the garbage man to come to take it away. We're always waiting for the garbage man to come to take it away. I suggest to you that the time, to, the time for waiting for the garbage man is long past. What we need to do is stop producing substances that we're introducing into our environment that are killing ourselves and other species on this planet. We need to put a stop to it now. The time for this is, is over. We need to live in balance with life. And we need to promote what we need to live in balance in life for. We need to make those decisions in our lives as individuals. And now I go around now and I make a presentation every once in a while. But I always like to leave those presentations with what I think is important information to convey to you. May talked about Dr. Rudy Nussbaum. He was my hero. He's a wonderful man. And I, I very much mourn his passing. When there was somebody to go to to talk about the health effects of radiation exposure, he was the man. He was an amazing man. And not only that, he was a Holocaust victim. And not only that, he also was very opposed to what Israel was doing to the Palestinians. I mean, he was, in my mind, he was an upright person. He was devoted to peace. And over there on the table, under the tree where I've been sitting, is the last article 
that he wrote before he died. It's entitled, Clinging to Nuclear Energy Option is a Reckless Denial of Reality. I invite you to go get it. Pick it up, read it, and you'll see what kind of man he was. Also, in memory of people who have died, I think of Arthur Honeyman. You know, Peter mentioned the, the uh, early Trojan decommissioning lions. Art Honeyman was a spastic. He had cerebral palsy. His body was contorted in this awful way. When he could barely speak, it was always very difficult to understand what art was all about. But boy, I'll tell you, inside that man's body was a furnace for change. I mean, he was one of the most courageous people that I knew. And I remember when Art went to the, the, the demonstration at Trojan in, 19, I believe it was 1977, and the, and the Trojan decommissioning, the early occupation was there, and Art was photographed by the Oregonian with his contorted body laying on the damn pavement that drove into the entrance to that plant to stop the workers from coming to work at Trojan. I mean, God, you know, that's the kind of people that we've got to become. We've got to constantly lift up our arms and go forward in, in an effort to make a difference in this world. Otherwise, we're going to lose the precious gift that we've been given in the form of life. I, my hat's off to Art. And, you know, my hat's off to, to, to Dr. Helen Caldicott. Look how far-reaching that woman is. Not only does she talk about nuclear weapons, but as she said, she went to Dr. Arjun Makajani with the Institute for Energy and Environmental Research, and she said to him, I commission you to do an analysis of whether or not it's possible that we can live in this world without nuclear power and without fossil coal plants, fossil fuel plants. And Arjun said, I don't know if that's possible. He really did not know. And she helped finance his research, and that led to this book that she mentioned today, Carbon Free, Nuclear Free, which there's a, a, a we have a, a thing from the IEER, it's a small pamphlet over on the table. Go over and get one, it's for free. But I'll tell you even better than that, this book is for free on the internet. You can get the whole damn book in PDF format, format for free. And you can read the book, I invite you to do so. It's important that we educate ourselves. And in the process of educating ourselves, I invite you to read another book. Amory Lovins has come out with a book entitled Reinventing Fire, Bold Business Solutions for a New Energy Era. Remember, Amory was one of those people that said that wind generation machines could supply electricity in the Pacific Northwest. And guess what? We just broke a record in the Pacific Northwest with that wind generation. We are now supplying 4,000 megawatts of energy from wind in the Pacific Northwest. When I first became an activist, the only place that you could find over 1,000 megawatts of wind generation was in Tehachapi, California. I mean, look at how far we have come, and we can go much farther, and that's what Amory's book is all about. Now. Also, I invite you to educate yourselves about the terrible health effects of radiation by scientists like Dr. Janet Sherman, who wrote a book called Life's Delicate Balance, and who edited the book that was published by the New York Academy of Sciences entitled Chernobyl, Consequences of the Catastrophe for People and the Environment. Over on that table, for free, is a DVD interview with Dr. Sherman entitled At the Source. And guess what? On this DVD is the PDF copy of the book by the New York Academy of Sciences on, that was done on Chernobyl that they charge $150 for, for free, along with Dr. Sherman's book, Life Delicate Balance. I'm telling you, there's no excuse for anyone here to be ignorant, none. There's no excuse at all. Go get these materials and educate yourself, because that's what it's all about. I also am grateful for the Occupy Movement's effort to do away with corporate personhood and reclaim our democracy from the 1%. Yeah. The military-industrial complex, the nuclear and fossil fuel industries, 
and the corrupt financial institutions that we're instructed to believe are too big to fail. Give me a break. It is in the ecological stewardship embodied in the choices that you and I make every day in our lives that's going to make a difference in this world. I'm reminded of the words of Homer Lee, who said, and I quote, to free a nation from error is to enlighten the individual. And it is only to the degree that an individual is receptive of the truth that a nation can be free from that vanity which ends in national ruin. What we face today is ecological ruin. And you and I are not going to let that happen. We're going to stop it with every breath of our lives, with every hope in our hearts, and with every ounce of our creativity. We are going to change ourselves for the better, and in doing so, live within the means of our compassion. I look forward to our future, and I thank you for the opportunity to stand with you today in solidarity for the well-being of planet Earth and the healing of ourselves upon it in peace.